Anyway, so we're happy to have Stacy here today, happy to have you here today. So without further ado, Stacy, I'm going to turn it over to you, and we'll see what she has to say to us. I'm going to turn this light out so they can see. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm so happy that I didn't get sick today, because <laughs> I was really disappointed that I couldn't come and speak with you last time. My name is Stacy Eubanks, and I'm the speech pathologist here at Southern Virginia Regional Medical Center. I've been here for about six months, and um, so far it's been great. I've met a lot of really wonderful members of the Emporia community, and I, may, I have met a few of you in different situations. Um, the first thing that I want to do is, is just take care of our little door prize that we had. I hope everyone got a chance to participate. Amazingly, we have a three-way tie. A three-way tie, if you can imagine. Three people guessed the exact number of M&Ms in the jar, which is equal to the number of times the average person swallows in one day. So what we're going to do is I'm going to call those three names, and I'm going to propose a second question, and I need you to just give me the number that you can think of, and we're going to see which one of those three is the closest, and that person will win the jar of M&Ms. So, the average person swallows 600 times a day, and the three people who guessed that number were Elaine Wheeler. Who's Elaine Wheeler? You are, okay. Um, Rick Young, all right, and uh, either a Mr. or a Mrs. Gendron, Okay, Mrs. Kindred. Okay, so this is the question that I want the three of you to consider. How many pairs of muscles are involved in each swallow? How many pairs of muscles are involved in each swallow? The reason that it's pairs is that everything in your mouth and your throat has two sides and they mirror each other. So it's pairs of muscles. All right, Ms. Wheeler, how many do you think? 20. Okay, and uh, Ms. Gendron? 12. 12, and Mr. Young? I'm sorry? 11. 11, okay. There are 50 pairs of muscles involved in every single swallow. So Ms. Wheeler wins the prize. Have you ever thought about swallowing and how many times a day you swallow? No, I didn't think I was working that hard. I know. <laughs> we don't think about that very often, do we? Until we can't do it anymore, until we start having trouble with it. And then we think about it a lot because when you need to do something about 600 times a day, it becomes very important to you. So we're going to talk about swallowing a little bit today. But I'm going to jump right into the presentation. Do I need a speech pathologist? Well, most people think that speech pathologists work with children on correcting their R sound or their S sound or their L sound. Those are the most common. And we do. We work with children. Um, we also work with children who have autism, um, language disorders. But we, we also work with adults. And the age group sitting in this room is usually... Um, the biggest group of adults that we work with as far as age. Did you know that more than 6 million adults over the age of 60 have a swallowing disorder? That's in the United States. 6 million over the age of 60 have a swallowing disorder that causes discomfort or dehydration, pneumonia, airway obstruction, sometimes even starvation, and embarrassing social situations. That's a real serious problem for people. Um, between 25 and 70 percent of patients who have a stroke will have a swallowing problem. And 89 percent of people who have Parkinson's disease will have a speech or a voice disorder. 
and about one million adults, the last one in the United States, have language disorders that are caused by stroke or head injury. All of these people are people that I would work with to help them, and then there's some others too. And I have a, a quick little video that I want to show you about this last one, um, about language disorders caused by stroke. So I'm going to step over to the computer and try to get that going. So that's a little bit about the condition called aphasia that affects people after they have a stroke. Um, swallowing disorders are another huge part of um, recovery from a stroke for many patients. And I did have a video about swallowing, but unfortunately the link was moved and I couldn't relocate it. So I'm just talking to you about that. Um, we are going to talk about that a lot more later. All right, so have you had a stroke? Have you suffered a head injury? 
Have you had head or neck cancer? Head or neck surgery? Or maybe you've been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. All of these um, conditions are conditions that oftentimes create the need for a speech pathologist to, to help a person. Do you have trouble swallowing your food? Do you get strangled when you drink your liquids? Do you know what you want to say but you can't get it out? Do you forget things easily? <laughs> Do you have to repeat yourself frequently in order to be understood? Well, you might need a speech pathologist if you answer yes to any of those questions. A speech pathologist can help you return to normal swallowing and communication. We can help you cope with swallowing and communication disorders if you cannot get back to normal. We can teach you ways to work around them. Um, we can help with strategies to improve memory for all of those of you who chuckled. <laughs> There are ways to improve that. Um, and we can teach family members and caregivers how to communicate with you and how to prepare food and drink that are safe for you to swallow. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, maybe I do need a speech pathologist, you may have some questions about how do I go about getting in touch. Um, the first thing would be that you would, you would need to call or visit your doctor um, to request a prescription to see a speech pathologist. Make an appointment. Come at least 30 minutes early to your first appointment. That's what we recommend here, but I would recommend that if you go anywhere um, for a first appointment because there's you know, always paperwork that you have to fill out. You also need to bring your medications or a list of medications including how often you take them and what dose you take because medications can affect all the things that we talked about, about memory, um, the way that you talk, the way that you swallow. Medications can have an impact on all of those things and we need to know that. If you were to see a speech pathologist, what should you expect? My number one thing, and the reason that it's in blue and in bold, is that you should expect to be treated with care, concern, and interest. You should expect to be treated well. And expect to review your medical history because it has everything to do with the problem that you're current, currently experiencing. Expect to be evaluated and to discuss the results with the speech pathologist. And also expect clear communication in terms you can understand. Um, if you don't get that, you need to ask questions because your questions are important. It's important for you to understand and not to just think that, you know, the person in the white coat who's using all the big words doesn't need to explain him or herself because you're the most important person in the room and you need to understand what's going on with your body. Um, oftentimes people are concerned about how to pay for the services, so I wanted to answer a question about that. Uh, most health insurance plans, including Medicare and Medicaid, provide coverage for speech pathology services based on medical necessity. So it's something that when we do the evaluation and the speech pathologist writes the report of what the problem is and what, how they think they might be able to help, the insurance company reviews that and determines whether or not they're going to pay for therapy, and they often do pay um, toward the therapy, if not all of it. All right, so I, I do want to talk to you about um, swallowing, and I think I'll do that now, and then I'll take some questions from you about any of the things that, that I presented. I, lots of questions are good, and I'll do the best that I can to answer them. Um, one thing that I definitely want to focus on with this group because of the age range present in the room is the impact of swallowing and swallowing problems that come up as people age. Um, some of the things that I look for when, when people come to me and say that they're having a swallowing problem, I'll ask them, do you find yourself coughing when you eat? Do you cough when you drink? 
Um, does your face turn red and do your eyes get watery? Um, do you have pain somewhere in your throat when you swallow? Do you feel like pills get stuck in your throat when you swallow or things that you eat? Do you find that you have uh, trouble swallowing one type of consistency of food? Maybe you have trouble with meats, but you don't have trouble with uh, softer things. Um, those are some of the, the questions that I ask. If you have trouble with coughing and with having watery eyes when you eat um, or drink uh, or feel pain when you swallow, I would be concerned that you might be aspirating. And aspiration is when the food goes down your airway instead of down your esophagus, which leads to your stomach. The, the airway sits right in front of the esophagus, and your larynx, which is your voice box, is supposed to help protect you from having food go into that airway, but it doesn't always work right because there are 50 pairs of muscles involved in that process. And if something goes wrong with one pair of those muscles, then you can end up in trouble, and you can have food going down your airway instead of down your esophagus. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that that bacteria that's going in is going straight into what part of your body if it's going down your airway? Into your lungs, that's right. And then you start developing respiratory infections and people get pneumonia, um, may get pneumonia two or three times in a short period of time. And that's an indicator that they could be aspirating or having food go, going down the wrong way. Um, people end up in the hospital all the time with pneumonia because of that. Uh, there are some other types of swallowing disorders and swallowing problems, reasons that people are having swallowing problems, uh, but those are definitely some of the things to watch for. And also, um, one other one that I wanted to mention is if your voice changes after you swallow, it sounds maybe gurgly after you drink, that's an indicator that you've got something that's trying to go the wrong way and it's sitting on your vocal folds, or your vocal cords, instead of behind that in the esophagus where it should go. Um, and I also want to say that it's not uncommon for everybody at some point in their life to get strangled on something. I mean, I have. I did it a couple times last week, and I thought, oh my goodness, I have a swallowing problem. <laughs> um, it's not uncommon for it to happen to people, but if it starts happening frequently, if it happens every time you sit down to a meal, or at least once or twice a day, then you, you should probably see your doctor about why that's happening. And maybe you know the doctor will refer you to a speech pathologist to help, help you discover what the problem is. Um, other things that, that are not as obvious that would be indicators of a swallowing problem would include unexplained weight loss. If you lose a lot of weight in a short period of time, it might be because you're not able to swallow things correctly. Dehydration, not getting enough fluids. It could be because subconsciously you know that you choke every time you drink, so you stop doing it because you don't want to choke. It's a horrible feeling. How many people have ever had a choking episode? or had a strength, getting strangled on something. It's a terrible feeling. You feel like you can't breathe. You start to feel like you're, you panic sometimes. It's an awful feeling. So people will just naturally stop eating and drinking things that cause them to do that. Then you can get dehydrated and you can lose weight. Um, you know, if you have a, an older family member who maybe is in a nursing home and they refuse to eat, they may not be able to tell you because they may not really realize what's going on, but people will just naturally stop eating when they feel like that they can't swallow safely. They just stop eating. Um, people that have shortness of breath after meals or have chest congestion every time they eat, after they eat, their chest is very congested. Um, and depression and fatigue are also things that we kind of watch for. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about swallowing. What happens if you come for treatment, for evaluation and treatment for a swallowing disorder, is that a lot of times what we'll do is a test called a modified barium swallow study. And that's a, it's an x-ray that's live and moving, and we can let you eat some things and watch exactly what happens with all those muscles and parts 
as it goes down. Um, and we can determine why you're having trouble, exactly what you're having trouble with, and if there's anything that we can do to help with that. And if there is something that we can do to help, then we'll have you come in for some therapy. We'll teach you some ways um, to hopefully eliminate the problem or deal with the problem if it can't be eliminated. I have one more thing that I want to talk to you about. Um, let me do that and then I will take your questions. I wanted to just talk a little bit more about stroke. Stroke is the big thing that, that everybody is afraid of and for good reason. Um, some signs, and I'm sure that you all probably know this already, but I can't stand up here as someone who works with patients who've had strokes and not talk to you about knowing the signs of a stroke and what to do about it. Um, sudden numbness or weakness of the face, arm or leg, especially on one side of the body. You experience that. Um, sudden confusion, trouble speaking or understanding. Sudden trouble seeing in one or both of your eyes. Or sudden trouble walking, maybe dizziness, loss of balance or coordination. And a, or a sudden severe headache with no known cause. If any of those symptoms you experience, you need to act fast. And I put the acronym over there, FAST. You've probably seen it before, but the F stands for face. So if a person's face or if your face, someone's looking at you and they're saying, oh, your face is getting twisted on one side, that's an immediate indicator. Arms. If you ask the person to raise their arms or you raise your arms in front of you and one of them drifts down and you can't hold it up, that's another thing that you should be really watching for. Um, speech. If your speech is suddenly slurred or garbled, you can't get out what you want to get out, or maybe you just sound like a person who's drunk with really slurred speech, that's definitely an indicator. And the T stands for time. Time is critical. If you're, if you're having a stroke, the first three hours are critical, and you've got to get to a hospital. Because I had somebody in my church that... Um, had a stroke and didn't go to the doctor until the next day. And if the person had gone to the, to the hospital, they may have been able to receive a drug that could have reversed the effects of the stroke. But once the three hour window is up, that drug cannot be administered. So it's critical that if you have any of these signs, the face, the arms, the speech, if you have any of these, you've got to get to a hospital as fast as you can. And it's, it's better to get to a hospital and have them say, no, it's not a stroke, than to not go and end up with all these problems that maybe could have been avoided. So, I just had to say it. <laughs> Act fast, call 911, okay? Now I'll take your questions. Yes, ma'am. Oh, over here it says, coming soon, vital stem. Yes, ma'am. Vital stem is a therapy that we use for swallowing disorders where we attach electrodes to the neck and the throat area uh -huh. and deliver an electrical stimulation to muscles that may not be working properly. Uh, we're not able to do it yet, but we're working toward being able to do that. Uh, does that usually help the condition? It depends on what exactly what's causing the problem, but it definitely has high success rates. In patients that we can use it on, it has high success rates to help because what it does is it activates the the muscles, the neural control of the muscles it activates that again when it's not working and it helps those muscles to begin to work again. So what are you saying? That part of the brain is not cannot work to stimulate the muscles, so they use the electrodes. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. That's the way that it operates. So, what do you think is a possibility about the brain? What could be wrong with the brain? Well, oftentimes we use that with patients who have had a stroke, and because of the stroke, it's that it's damaged the parts of the circuits of the brain that connect to the muscles. It's maybe damaged them so that it the, the signals are not getting all the way to the muscles. To make them work, and sometimes it depends. It may happen at the brain. It may happen lower toward where the muscle is because the nerves run to the muscles and control them. So we're reactivating with that something that has been deactivated by either a stroke 
or maybe a, a traumatic brain injury from a car accident. Um, sometimes we can use it on people that have had issues like that. Uh, anything else? Anything else as far as? Yeah, uh, the leg stroke. Or stroke or anything else. Uh, well, we only use the vital stem as, as specifically for swallowing issues. So the other therapies like physical therapy and occupational therapy sometimes use electrodes and that kind of that type of therapy with the same principles with other parts of the body. We use the vital stem only for swallowing issues. Sure. Absolutely. Yes it is. <laughs> other questions? Yes. Mm -mm. No. <laughs> no, please don't wait. Please don't wait. Even. No, no. Just one of those is enough. Just one. Remember, it's you know what do we always say? It's better to be safe than sorry. sorry. Okay, so be safe. Go get checked out. Don't be sorry later when you can't swallow and you can't talk anymore and you're having thinking problems and memory problems. If any of that can be avoided, go get checked. Yes, ma'am. That's a good question. Um, the critical period after a stroke is usually within the first year, but that doesn't mean that making progress is not possible after the first year. It means that the greatest amount of recovery, actually the greatest amount of recovery is going to be in the first six months, but up to a year. And then after that, the amount of recovery that a person can make diminishes. But it doesn't mean that it's not possible. It just kind of lowers, it, it lowers the range of where you can, what you can achieve the longer you go after the stroke. And so that's another another point to make too. You know, if something like that happens to you or someone that you love, try not to wait to get treatment because you really need, and, and especially with um, the language disorders that can come after a stroke, it's research has shown that the more therapy a person gets every week in that critical period, especially during the first six months, they make leaps and bounds of progress beyond people who don't get it. So really need to get in and get the therapy, get the help. Um, and a lot of times people will isolate because they don't want other people to know, you know, we could talked about swallowing problems causing embarrassing social situations. People will stop going out to dinner because they choke all the time or maybe because of the stroke their lip hangs to to their, you know, their lips don't work correctly, so sometimes things will run out of their mouth and it's embarrassing, so they don't go into social situations anymore. And when people start limiting their participation in their relationships and the social circles that they have, it's easy to become depressed. And then that causes other problems. Um, also, the loss of language. If someone is not able to talk the way they used to, they might be embarrassed about it. They might be worried that someone will find them out. You know, and so then we avoid for the same reasons. And, and that's really sad. It definitely can lead to depression and some other problems. Does, does, does that answer your question? And I went on a little bit too. Other questions? If one is epileptic, mm -hmm. does it have something to do with the memory? Memory. You know, that is a really good question that I don't feel 100% qualified to answer. I think I'm going to have to redirect you to someone else on that question just because I don't want to give you information that's not correct. I think that it's possible that it could, but I don't have enough facts to back that up. So a, a neurologist would definitely be able to answer the question for you. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I have a comment. Some of y'all probably already know that I had a stroke in 86. Prior to that, I had brain surgery a couple times. After the stroke, I could not talk. I was so mad at the speech therapist when she 
come to my room. I opened up the bed for from April, excuse me, from May the 16th until sometime in July. I would throw things at her when, when she would walk in the door because she kept trying to get me to say words and I couldn't say them. I knew what they were up here, but it wouldn't come right here. But anyway, they worked with me for quite a, quite a while over there and have continued to work with me since. And y'all know me the way I am today. I no longer in, in the wheelchair. <laughs> I can read. I went back to college. I studied to be a computer program assistant analyst and succeeded. I wasn't able to take my exam on Friday when the rest of the college students took theirs. But my instructor would set me down and she was able to communicate with me so that I could succeed in passing the exam for the Friday. We took a college course a week and exam Friday from January through July. So I just wanted to tell y'all, if y'all have anyone that has a problem like this, the most important thing you can do is get help. This, uh, the, it's, it's unreal again. I did not like it. I didn't want anything to do with it. But I feel like I am where I am today because of the help that I received from the people like her. Thank you for sharing that. Sounds like you've made an excellent recovery, too. <laughs> yes, ma'am. When you first start drought therapy, how often do you have it? How many times a week? Okay, that's a good question. It totally depends on what the disorder is or what is the reason for needing the therapy. Um, when it's someone who has aphasia, which is the language disorder that we've talked about that happens after a stroke, uh, or apraxia, which is another one I should tell you what that is. Um, we usually try to do twice a week at least because the more intense your therapy is in that first period, um, the better it is for you. Now, if the person is in the hospital, I see them every day that I'm here in that situation. But if it's an outpatient, we try to do at least two times a week. And right now, I'm at the hospital here three days a week, so that can kind of limit. I can't see people every day, um, but I'm here three days a week, and so I do as much as I can with patients. Um, if it's a swallowing disorder, you may come once a week. Uh, I have a couple of patients that are doing so well now in their, in their process that they're coming once every other week, so we kind of adjust it according to how you're doing and what your needs are. And I do, someone asked me if I see children. I do also see children. I have um, children as young as two right now coming and people as old as 95. So broad spectrum in our profession, we say we see people from the cradle to the grave. <laughs> All the way. <laughs> Other questions? How many people in this room um, have ever known someone who had a speech problem? How about a swallowing problem? Okay, a voice disorder? Somebody who had trouble using their voice or a voice problem? Stuttering? How about have you ever known, this one might not be as many, have you ever known someone who had Lou Gehrig's disease and was unable to speak at all? There's something that really, really cool that we can do to help those people. I didn't bring the video of that today, but um, once people with Lou Gehrig's disease get to the later stages, they're not able usually to move any of their muscles, with the exception of their breathing muscles and their eyes many times. And so we are able to set them up with a communication device that they can uh, control with blinking of their eyes, and it will speak for them. Um, and I'm working on one of those right now. It's not, it's not for an ALS patient. It's for a, another patient. It actually was a stroke patient uh, who was unfortunately left able to understand everything and able to say nothing. And so for her, um, we're actually in the process of getting a device now that she'll be able to use to talk to people. She'll be able to use it to make phone calls. Um, she'll be able to use it to um, send email and get on the internet. It also has con controls 
you know, for the, to turn the TV on and off, to turn the lights on and off. It's pretty amazing, but we also um, can help people with those types of devices. Any other questions? Does laryngitis have anything to do with any of this? Because I've had it within the last three weeks, and when I, when I was in that condition, I couldn't talk, mm -hmm. which made him happy. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've since, you know, when I was would get around people and I would say something and they would hear that I couldn't, then they were saying, well, so-and-so's got it, so-and-so got it. So it seems like it's been several people in the area that have had the laryngitis in the last several weeks. And are you asking if the laryngitis affects swallowing? If it has and anything to do with what you were talking about today, you know, the losing of the voice for no reason. It's like on Sunday, um, I was speaking normally. Mm -hmm. By Sunday night, I was beginning to lose my voice, and then on Monday, I could just do as a whisper, mm -hmm. and it lasted approximately three weeks. And that's, you know, three weeks is about kind of like my personal cutoff. If someone tells me they've had it longer than that, I usually would make a referral to the ENT, first of all, to make sure that there's nothing like a growth on your vocal folds that would be causing that laryngitis um, to find out, you know, what's causing it first. If it's a virus, that's not something that, you know, we're going to be able to, to do anything about. But if you're having maybe um, sometimes one of the vocal folds will become paralyzed and cause you to sound like you have laryngitis where you're not able to use your voice or if there's something like a growth on the vocal folds or something like that, we would send you to an ENT first to make sure of exactly what the problem is. And then, depending on what it is, then there are treatments that could be um, offered in order to help resolve the problem. And the treatments for those types of things are really varied. It can go from, you know, someone might need surgery, or it could go to maybe just you need some voice therapy um, to help. I was working with, actually, um, a pastor who was having some voice problems and a lot of it was because he was doing some things when he was delivering, when he was using his voice that were abusive and causing him to have laryngitis. So it can be, you know, for a variety of reasons, but the first thing that we would do is send you to an ENT to make sure, you know, that you don't have anything structural that's impacting it. I, I just thought that it was unusual that there were several of us at the same time. And it could be, in that case, it might be a, a, a virus that's causing it. You know, if there are a lot of different people getting in it. So, but like I said, if it's longer than three weeks, that's when I start to consider that it maybe isn't a virus. It could be something else. So, Thank you. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Other questions? MS, is it a hip injury or is it still? Multiple sclerosis MS. Um, it's a degenerative disease that, um, it's a, well, let me see if I can explain this a little bit. It's not because of a head injury. A head injury is more what we call like if you have a car accident or a fall where you sh strike your head against something. Um, those would be things that we would classify as head injuries. MS is a degenerative disease that would be in the same family with um, Lou Gehrig's disease where there's a degeneration process that's happening in the brain where the um, neural circuits are breaking down or all the connections that fire to each other to make your brain work. Part of that stops working gradually and it kind of spreads and so that's what we call a neurodegenerative disease and so it's not a head injury but it definitely occurs in the brain and causes problems for the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I have also something that I want to share with you. Um, I did print a two-page, well, it's a front and back informational sheet on swallowing, which is also called dysphagia, which is different than aphasia. We talked about aphasia, that's where you have a loss of language. Dysphagia is a swallowing problem. So I did print something um, that if you are interested in it, I think I'm going to just leave it right up at this table and you can pick one up um, on your way out. If 
there are no other questions. Thank you, thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Stacey, you'll stick around if anybody would like to have anything to say to her. You know,